Um, I'll just introduce our next speaker. Um, Katharina Mischer is part of Mischer Traxler, a studio founded by herself and Thomas Traxler in Vienna in 2009. After they graduated from the IM Master's Department at the Design Academy Eindhoven and had been collaborating, working together for a few years. Their projects are in the permanent collections of institutions such as the Art Institute of Chicago, the Vitra Design Museum, and the MAC Museum in Vienna. Their work has won several awards, very prestigious awards, including the Wu Guangzhong Art and Science Innovation Award in 2012, and the Austrian Experimental Design Award in 2009. As a studio, Mischer Traxler were honored with the Designer of the Future Award by Design Miami Basel in 2011, and in April 2014, they won the Be Open Young Talent Award. So here with us today to talk about misusing what is there, please welcome Katharina Mischer. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm part of Mischa Draxler. Uh, the other shadow, the larger one, is Thomas. He sends his nicest regards. And actually, we are a design studio in Vienna. We are small and young, but we have a wide variety of projects. So our portfolio ranges from product and furniture design, from interaction design, from production processes up to media art. And they are all very different in the stories they tell, but they somehow all balance between handcraft and technology. And they all have in common as well that there's no particular one interest, but a large amount of interest. And as well that they share, all projects share that we always start with the briefing and we really analyze what the project should go to rather than thinking of a final outcome. So our projects have in common that a project has to make sense in its given context. And to us, this means, I mean, it's not the old principle, but we really apply it to most of our project because we really believe there's a difference if I design a project for an old people's home or for a kindergarten, and there's a difference if I design a project for Europe or the Middle East. So you have to take this context very serious because it really makes a difference for the project because every project has a certain responsibility that you should take um, uh, sensible. And this is as well why we somehow as well refer to our work that we somehow use what is already there or sometimes we misuse what is already there. Because we never invent something new, we just take what we can find and we try to make logic connections. And rather than inventing, we try to innovate through the combinations we can find either in the backgrounds of the projects or in the context they are playing in. But before coming here, of course, when I like, discussed with Thomas what I should present here for the open conference, we talked a lot about, well, we are not experts in openness. And we, we actually are not experts in anything, but in many little things. So um, we discussed, OK, in, for openness, we could talk about our project, for example, the idea of a tree that is very open towards external inputs. It's a solar power production process that produces one object a day from sunrise to sunset. And depending where it's placed, uh, the, pro the projects get longer and shorter depending on the seasons. And the weather is as well inc incorporated in the final results. But we thought, no, we're not going to talk about that. And we thought, OK, we could talk about processes like you till, you, till You Stop, which is a, a production process that allows the consumer in the end to decide how much decoration to put on an object. And uh, for example, here we did it for a museum as a cake decoration machine. And we chose as well to talk about decoration on cakes because so many things in our daily life are decorated and hardly really thought of how much decoration should be put. So the audience could really choose how much decoration to put. But we thought, no, we are not really going into detail with that. And of course, for an open conference, we could talk about something like the fade workshops where we share and sh share an idea of how to use old scrap wood in order to make new furniture with people in 
like, and we make workshops and we build together. And of course, some of the participants never built anything before and they get very excited and very happy when they finally have a little thing they really made by themselves. But we thought, okay, when coming here, um, we really want to focus on, on the talk on relationships between labor and final objects and forms of transparency, because we think transparency is what's lacking these days and there must be a discussion about labor and objects. So we picked a few projects that we think shared these ideas together. And the first one I'm gonna show you um, is Collective Works. We did it in 2011 and it was, in the briefing it was asked that we should make a project that makes strangers interact with each other. And we thought, well, sometimes there's a reason that strangers don't want to interact with each other and um, we are not in the point that we want to force people to do so. So we wanted to come up with something that engages people automatically without being forced. So we built a machine that needs a lot of people to collaborate on the production. And um, yeah, it's a very simple machine, but very clever. It's uh, Collective Works is a production process, which is just fully functioning when people pay attention to the producing machine. Reacting to its audience, it translates the flow of people into an object. And it does so that it doesn't do anything if nobody's there. Basically, it waits. It wants attention, otherwise it doesn't do anything. If somebody comes, like you see on the corner, it start, it's activated and it just pulls a vineyard strip. And then the more people are coming, uh, color is added to the produced object. And the more people are joining this process, the more color is added. And for us, it's somehow about collaboration, that the more people are part of a conversation, or the peop more people join a project, the more colorful and the more bigger it can get. And for the process itself, we use a vineyard strip that goes through a color basin, uh, glue basin. It's attached to a wooden board and to a platform that automatically moves downwards. And the more people are working the machine, sort of, the platform moves downwards. And when it moves downwards, it automatically builds up the basket. And the interesting thing is as well, of course, we cannot really produce in the studio because we are just two people, so it would, yeah, it doesn't really make sense. So we had even to make a part in the studio in order to come up with a, a movie to show how it functions. And we chose as well to work on a basket because baskets normally were always used to collect um, things like baskets for fruits, baskets for honey, like things in history. Vessels were always kept to collect things. And we decided to make as well, as well a vessel but in itself, the vessel is already a collection. It's a collection of data, of participation, but as well of interest. We call it sometimes production on interest because it just produces if somebody's interested in it. Um, the machine functions via sensors in the frame, and it doesn't matter from which direction you're approaching the machine. It always detects how many people are there and reacts according to that. There are altogether four pens, and they draw uh, on the veneer immediately when somebody goes there. And there is some kind of color coding. It's not a random pattern that appears. It's really according to the participation of the people. So the sections that are just plain wood, it's the part where just one person was somehow uh, moving the machine. And the sections that get more and more dark, the more people were involved. And that the really black sections, there were a minimum of five or more people involved in the production process. And when we presented the work the first time, it worked very well that people were engaging with the machine because it was a very playful thing to do. But we realized as well that the project somehow, it, it, it's recording the interest of work and every basket becomes unique. But it's as well that it questions labor because when we showed it in a fair, Suddenly the whole audience, even collectors, they were turned into workers because without the audience, there wouldn't be a final piece. So the question was, what is labor as well? Because is dedicating time already labor, but we need the time of the audience, otherwise we wouldn't have a result. And it as well questioned, because normally these days, like we heard before, um, machines are radically elimin eliminating people in production. And these days you can have huge 
production facilities with 100 machines handled by maybe two people, and suddenly we make one crappy machine, well, simple machine that needs a lot of people handling it. So it really questions how should labor focus on in the future, because it cannot be that we just press a few buttons. It should be more, but it's really how can we introduce human labor in production processes by not just having people watching machines, what we somehow do right now. Um, so you've seen in the previous projects that we really enjoy technology. We like talking about technology and the idea of how it could change production processes and how it, it could really make a difference in how we make things. But recently, we started as well, we, maybe we have to look at basics. Because just because there are many machines, we really need to think of, well, what to do with them. And it all started as well with all these exhibitions and catalogs and uh, magazines about 3D printing and that 3D printing will be the future and that it will be possible to print everything and moreover that the home will be the new place to produce everything. And then we were like, well, to production at home, production in one place, it's not such an unfamiliar concept. Like a few hundred years ago, in farms, people were very able to do basic things from scratch and they knew their daily objects, really where they came from and how much labor went into them. And we thought, if the future is really about that maybe people might believe that things just pop, pop out of 3D printers, maybe something goes wrong. And that's how we started the project. Um, how we wondered, in general, as the knowledge and understanding of how to produce objects fades, does this change our relationship to them? And we definitely think yes, because even as designers that we handle materials every day, we sometimes start projects and we think of, for example, fabric and metals. And when I close my eyes and we discuss, when I think of fabric or wool or metal, I think of thread and extruded things. But in fact, what we would should think of or what should be logic is that we need to think of the sheep or the field that the fabric comes from or the ore that at the mine that gives the ore that we can actually do the metals. So we thought somehow we're getting more and more disconnected and maybe we should do something to get a bit more connected again. And that's why we started the Knowledge Tools Memory Project. It's very simple. It's objects that work as tools and manu manuals that show you how you could actually reproduce it. So the first uh, piece in the series is a blanket. It's a woven woolen blanket. And it shows you from the beginning to the end what it actually takes to make a blanket. And it enables you that if you were willing, you could do it as well from scratch. And it's as well an idea, well, yeah, it shows from, for the woolen blanket, it shows that you need a sheep, that you need to take the sheep's hair, you need to turn it into thread, etc., etc. But it's not just about telling people that you have the possibility to do it. It's as well that we shouldn't get too dependent on all the machines and everything that can be produced these days. Because we should keep in mind that we ourselves, without electricity, without anything, we are already capable of doing a lot of things. And that knowledge shouldn't be lost. Um, uh, for the blanket, we didn't uh, do the fabric but we stitched everything by hand, so at least we did some manual work and we had actually to stitch more than 100 hours to have the graphics really accurate. And with the blanket, it comes as well with the tools so that you really could do it and replicate it again. And as well in the instructions on the blanket, it tells you if you really replicate it, maybe put again the information on it, how to reproduce it. And the project for us is not finished. We plan to do more objects in this idea that somehow they can tell you the story how it was made and what it takes to make it and that the knowledge of how to make basic things can be embedded within the object so that we are reconnected to the actual sources. And funny enough, this year we were asked to make a rapid prototype project. And we were like, okay, Interesting, um, we don't want to do something that just pops out of a machine, but we were quite restricted in the size because it was for an exhibition. 
And we thought, okay, how can we bring this idea of the knowledge tools memory project into a rapid prototype typed object? And we, we decided to make a project called Transcoded. And it plays on the idea that as well, maybe in rapid prototyping, we could include the manual of reproduction. But of course, since rapid prototyped objects are not manually made, uh, it has to be done in a completely different way. And we thought maybe it could be interesting to translate how, what we as designers or consumers see as an object and what the machines actually see when they do the thing. So we had the idea to really visualize a code that you can use a code to decode the object. And we were inspired as well by the Rosetta Stone that you needed in order to, like a uh, thousand years later, to uh, descript the hieroglyphs. So we thought, okay, we make something similar, but of course different. And basically, the only thing we designed is the little box you see top in the corner. Um, that's the object we could make, because we decided we make an object. And on the object, there should be the code that you would put in the machine in order to do it. And if you type in the code, it would pop out the object. But since we were limited in uh, volume, our object got very tiny. It's really the small rectangle piece in the corner. And all around it, the first layer you can see is the hexadecimal code. So if you type that in, you would get the object, but as well, the final binary code. So either way, if you type in one of the codes into a machine, it would be turned into that object. And of course, you could go more complicated, but then we decided, well, we were limited in scale, because once you even just make a proper vase, the code would be so large that the vase would be incredibly big. Here's a detail of the file and the final piece in the exhibition. And um, with the, somehow with the previous projects, you can see that we are somehow into recording and how to, te to tell how things are made, why they are made, how long it takes. And we were asked to design a, a rug for an uh, Italian company. And we were very happy to do a rug because it's something we haven't done before, so we thought it's exciting. And we talked to the company and by investigating and talking to the company owner, we found out that actually to, to, to not, to, to yeah, manually make a Persian carpet, it takes a lot of time. It takes somewhere between two months till half a year, depending on the, like, how many knots are per, per inch and how big the piece is. So it's a lot of manual labor and a lot of time it takes. So we wanted to make a project that somehow shows the the, the, the buyer in the end, how long it really took to make the object. So we designed to make the day-by-day -day carpet. And the day-by-day -day carpet is basically, um, we send a, a pattern that is similar to a cell structure, but normally when we send it to the uh, producing company, it's just black and white. And there's a selection of colors that would be applied every day. So for every day, they get a dark color and a lighter shade of color. And every day, they would not. And the next day, they get a new pair of color. So that's why the carpet gets slowly striped. And each stripe represents one day of manual labor. So you can see it's as well a system rather than one single design. It's a system that can be changed in size. But even then, the, the principle of working can be applied. And even then, it becomes a unique piece because it really depends on the pace of working rhythm from uh, the not notter. Um, there were some misunderstandings things in the first place, but finally we had our rug. And it really, like, when you receive a final one, you can count all the little stripes and you know, okay, my carpet took 33 days or my carpet took 120 days of knotting. And since that, it's very, since that is very important to us, we as well decided that we put a label on, on the rug and it tells you who made it, because it's always the work by one single man or single woman. And it tells you when it started, when it finished, so that you have like the proof of if you counted correctly. And um, what was very interesting when we handed the project in and we started talking to friends and people we know about the project, there came the question, aren't you afraid that now 
that everyone can see how fast the work is working, aren't you afraid that they have to work faster? And we were like, hmm, to be honest, we haven't really thought about that. But it somehow gave us the idea that it's very interesting to show transparency because transparency can make people think, can open up discussion, and that's what we were very happy with. So thank you. Thanks, that was great. Uh, very interesting ideas about how to share information uh, and what that means for openness. Are there any questions uh, for Katerina? Questions? Okay, thank you. Oh, a question there. field of open design as a designer, like the best things that designer can focus on in the next years? Like it's, I know it's kind of complicated, but since you are a designer, you're starting thinking about that. It's a complicated question, yeah. but um, I think, first of all, I really believe putting some transparency back into things is at least at an hour agenda, because it, it really feels like we are getting more and more disconnected. and especially with all the technology coming in, we're getting more disconnected. So I think it's about reconnecting. And in the sense of sharing and openness, I think, especially like the, 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 when we, we, we did the, uh, the, the blanket, it was as well, okay, many people are able to do a lot of things. But in fact, maybe, like you can, yeah, you can produce a lot of things at home, like craft and nice things. So, but some people are more gifted, some are not. So maybe with all the openness and open discussion about 3D printing and sharing files, it should be about how to enable people that are a bit uh, having difficulties with finding an aesthetic language or a language that they even like themselves. I think designers can enable helping those people that are not so trained to easily get to the results they really appreciate. Otherwise, they will print out things that they actually hate and they don't even know how to tilt that. So I guess designers can start thinking of if they share files, how can you make it easier if it's customizable so that somebody likes it, that it as well becomes um, in a way that the final producer, like the audience or the, um, the ordinary people at home, are very happy with the result in the end, rather than just having something print that they actually don't like. So, by the way, congratulations, because your works are beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we now have a coffee break, and we reconvene at 12. <laughs>